A Satire Against Reason and Mankind by John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester. Were I, who to my cost already am one of those strange prodigious creatures, man, a spirit free to choose for my own share what case of flesh and blood I please to wear, I'd be a dog, a monkey, or a bear, or anything but that vain animal who is so proud of being rational. The senses are too gross, and he'll contrive a sixth to contradict the other five. And before certain instinct will prefer reason, which fifty times for one does err. Reason, an ignis fatuous in the mind, which, leaving light of nature, sense behind, pathless and dangerous wandering ways it takes, through errors, fenny bogs, and thorny breaks. Whilst the misguided follower climbs with pay pain, mountains of whimsies heaped in his own brain, stumbling from thought to thought, falls headlong down into doubt's boundless sea, where, like to drown, books bear him up a while, and make him try to swim with bladders of philosophy. In hope still to overtake the escaping light, the vapor dances in its dazzling sight, till, spent, it leaves him to eternal night. Then old age and experience hand in hand lead him to death, and make him understand, after a search so painful and so long that all his life he has been in the wrong, huddled in dirt the reasoning engine lies, who was so proud, so witty, and so wise. Pride drew him in as cheats their bubbles catch, and made him venture to be made a wretch. His wisdom did his happiness destroy, aiming to know that world he should enjoy. And wit was his vain, frivolous pretense of pleasing others at his own expense. For wits are treated just like common whores, first they're enjoyed, and then kicked out of doors. The pleasure past, a threatening doubt remains, that frights the enjoyer with succeeding pains. Women and men of wit are dangerous tools and ever fatal to admiring fools. Pleasure allures, and when the fops escape, tis not that they're beloved, but fortunate, and therefore what they fear at heart they hate. But now, methinks, some formal band and beard takes me to task. Come on, sir, I'm prepared. Then, by your favor, anything that's writ against this jiving, jingling knack called wit likes me abundantly. But you take care upon this point not to be too severe. Perhaps my muse were fitter for this part, for I profess I can be very smart on wit, which I abhor with all my heart. I long to lash it in some sharp essay, but your grand indiscretion bids me stay, and turns my tide of ink another way. What rage ferments in your degenerate mind to make you rail at reason in mankind? Blessed glorious man to whom alone kind heaven and everlasting soul has freely given whom his great maker took such care to make that from himself he did the image take. And this fair frame in shining reason dressed to dignify his nature above beast. Reason, by whose aspiring influence we take a flight beyond material sense, dive into mysteries, then soaring, pierce the flaming limits of the universe, search heaven and hell, find out what's acted there, and give the world true grounds of hope and fear. Hold, mighty man, I cry, all this we know. From the pathetic pen of Angelo, from Patrick's pilgrim, sib soliloquies, and tis this very reason I despise, this supernatural gift that makes a mite think he's the image of the infinite, comparing his short life, void of all rest, to the eternal and the ever-blessed. This busy, puzzling stir-up of doubt that frames deep mysteries, then finds him out, filling with frantic crowds of thinking fools those reverend bedlams, colleges, and schools born on whose wings each heavy sought can pierce the limits of the boundless universe. So charming ointments make an old witch fly and bear a crippled carcass through the sky. Tis this exalted power whose business lies in nonsense and impossibilities. This made a whimsical philosopher before the spacious world his tub prefer. And we have modern cloistered coxcombs who retire to think because they have naught to do. But thoughts are given for action's government. Where action ceases, thoughts impertinent. Our sphere of action is life's happiness, and he who thinks beyond thinks like an ass. Thus, whilst against false reasoning I inveigh, I own right reason which I would obey. That reason which distinguishes by sense and gives us rules of good and ill from thence, that bounds desires with the reforming will to keep him more in vigor, not to kill. Your reason hinders, 
mine helps to enjoy. Renewing appetites yours would destroy. My reason is my friend. Yours is a cheat. Hunger calls out, my reason bids me eat. Perversely, yours, your appetite does mock. This asks for food. That answers, what's a clock? This plain distinction, sir, your doubt secures. Tis not true reason I despise, but yours. Thus, I think reason righted but for man. I'll never recant. Defend him if you can. For all his pride and his philosophy, tis evident beasts are in their degree as wise at least and better far than he. Those creatures are the wisest who attain by surest means the ends at which they aim. If, therefore, Jowler finds and kills his hairs better than mirrors, supplies his committee chairs, though one's a statesman, the other but a hound, Jowler and justice would be wiser found. You see how far man's wisdom here extends. Look next if human nature makes amends. Whose principles most generous are and just, and whose morals you would sooner trust. Be judge yourself, I'll bring it to the test. Which is the basest creature, man or beast? Birds feed on birds, beasts on other prey, but savage man alone does man betray. Pressed by necessity, they kill for food. Man undoes man to do himself no good. With teeth and claws by nature armed, they hunt nature's allowance to supply their want. But man, with smiles, embraces friendship, praise, inhumanly his fellow's life betrays. With voluntary pains works his distress, not through necessity, but wantonness. For hunger, for love, they fight and tear, whilst wretched man is still in arms for fear. For fear he arms, and is of arms afraid, by fear to fear successively betrayed. Base fear, the source, whence his best passions came, his boasted honor, and his dear-bought fame. That lust of power to which he's such a slave, and for the which alone he dares be brave, to which his various projects are designed, which makes him generous, affable, and kind, for which he takes such pains to be thought wise, and screws his actions in a forced disguise. Leading a tedious life in misery, under laborious mean hypocrisy. Look to the bottom of his vast design, wherein man's wisdom, power, and glory join. The good he acts, the ill he does endure, tis all from fear to make himself secure. Merely for safety after fame we thirst, for all men would coward would be cowards if they durst. And honesty is against all common sense. Men must be knaves, tis in their own defense. Mankind's dishonest, if you think it fair, amongst known cheats to play upon the square. You'll be undone. Nor can weak truth your reputation save. The knaves will agree to call you knave. Wronged shall he live, insulted over, oppressed, who dares be less a villain than the rest. Thus, sir, you see what human nature craves. Most men are cowards. All men should be knaves. The difference lies, as far as I can see, not in the thing itself, but the degree. And all the subject matter of debate is only, who's a knave of the first rate? All this with indignation have I hurled at the pretending part of the proud world, who, swollen with selfish vanity, devise false freedoms, holy cheats, and formal lies over their fellow slaves to tyrannize. But if in court so just a man there be, in court a just man, yet unknown to me, who does his needful flattery direct not to oppress and ruin, but protect, since flattery, which way soever laid, is still a tax on that unhappy trade. If so upright a statesman you can find whose passions bend to his unbiased mind, who does his arts and policies apply to raise his country, not his family, nor, whilst his pride owned avarice withstands, receives close bribes through friends' corrupted hands. Is there a churchman who on God relies, whose life his faith and doctrine justifies? Not one blown up with vain prelatic pride, who for reproof of sins does man deride, whose envious heart makes preaching a pretense, with his obstreperous saucy eloquence, to chide at kings and rail at men of sense. None of that sensual tribe whose talents lie in avarice, pride, sloth, and gluttony, who hunt good livings but abhor good lives, 
whose lust exalted to that height arrives, they act adultery with their own wives. And ere a score of years completed be, can from the lofty pulpit proudly see half a large parish their own progeny. Nor doting bishop who would be adored for domineering at the council board, a greater fop in business at fourscore, fonder of serious toys, affected more than the gay glittering fool at twenty, proves with all his noise, his tawdry clothes and loves. But a meek, humble man of honest sense, who preaching peace does practice continence, whose pious life's a proof he does believe, mysterious truths which no man can conceive. If upon earth there dwell such godlike men, I'll here recant my paradox to them. Adore those shrines of virtue, homage pay, and with the rabble world their laws obey. If such there be, yet grant me this at least, man differs more from man than man from beast. <laughs>